I had to ask myself a question to get started, and that was, what if you met a man who said, I'll support your dreams. I'll help you in every way. I'll go with you. And you responded, uh, no, uh, you'll change me. That is exactly what happened to Catarina de la Alvarado in this book, when she meets the man who's not the man of her dreams. Uh, the story kind of escalates when this gringo okay, decides that Katharina, who's a migrant worker, requires his subterfuge to achieve her goals. And he pretty much ignores her fierce ambition, her unerring intuition, and her raw intelligence. Did that happen back in the 60s in this, in this culture? Um, it touched the Mayan moon. It's, uh, it's pretty colorful. It is a little passionate, and it is a love story. Not as passionate as Betty's. <laughs> but my daddy raised his eyebrow. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, and it's set during a time when Hispanic culture began to assert itself. And uh, I think most of us uh, remember that happening in the Rio Grande Valley. And uh, this is because the one place in the United States where two very rich cultures, the Mexican culture and the American culture, the Texas culture, come together. And it really is a land that's very different from every place else in the world. Nobody writes about it very much except in nonfiction. Uh, they don't write about it in fiction very much. And I just, I, I just love this place and I love the mixed cultures. And I think that America and the direction that it's going has a lot to learn from us. They really do about how to live together and how great it can be. Um, the book is kind of woven together by a theme of self-determination uh, from some Mayan legends, uh, thus the um, title, Touch the Mayan Moon. And uh, the conflict, conflict reaches its zenith when, I call it an undertow of love, passion, and power. <laughs> Uh, suck the characters deep into the Yucatan where their fates really are determined by a storm, a murder, and a lie. Okay. Are the things that make the determination. Um, I really do love the culture down here. Uh, I, um, I used to do a lot of public speaking across the country when <clears throat> in my career and uh, I made stories a big part of my presentations. And I would always get reviews that said, more stories, more stories. And so I write this story out of love for the culture, the region, and the belief that no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, <coughs> we can save each other. We can. So here is uh, a little snippet from Touch the Mayan Moon. Uh, I chose a, a passage that kind of highlights one of the homes where most of us probably grew up, okay, in a house just like this. Um, this starts out, the two main characters um, have briefly met prior to this encounter that I'm going to read you. Um, the hero, Case Becker, is coming to the barrio to teach CPR at the request of Catarina's brother, Sixto after having saved uh, little Alberto, uh, their friend, from drowning. And this uh, scene starts at a house, like I said, here in the valley that's just like one of ours. <clears throat> El Camino Ratama was a dirt road just outside the reach of community zoning laws. Someone put up a hand-painted sign that resembled the town's official ones. The street led to a neighborhood of tiny ramsackle houses where dogs, chicken, and children ran loose. The nicest house had a leaning chain link fence surrounding the lot. A tall Mexican fan palm stood like a sentry at each corner. Together, the fence and the palms marked an oasis in the dust. It was filled with lovingly tended hibiscus, bougainvillea, gardenia, roses, and sunflowers. The house was very pink. Case knocked at the loose screen door. He planned on spending an hour showing Sixto the basics of CPR and making his excuses before dinner. He was truly irritated with himself for caving in so easily to this request. 
He thought about not showing up at all, but hell, he had no other plans tonight, so here he was. From the number of different voices he heard inside, he wondered how many people could live at 800 square feet. He was surprised by who rushed to the door to greet him. Three wild young boys bounced off the walls of a narrow entranceway. One of them announced, Es el gringo! Mm -hmm. Case recognized Alberto. Instead of stepping back to make room for Case to enter, it seemed they pressed forward with eagerness only enjoyed by the very young. Sixto appeared behind the boys and elbowed his way to the door. We call them los lobos, he explained. On cue, the boys howled like wolves. A chihuahua joined the song, and he put so much energy into his bark that his little feet left the ground with every bark. <laughs> Is Alberto your son? No, he's my best friend, right, Alberto? Sixto gave a wolf howl of his own. Mm. Just when Case found room to make his move to squeeze into the house, more people filled the hallway. The faces looked familiar, and by the time he made it to the living room, he began to recognize many of these people from Sunday afternoon in the park. Their faces looked different with smiles on them. Alberto shoved his pet box turtle in the air for Case to greet. He then came eye to eye with a scarlet macaw who introduced herself as Lola. <laughs> Lola sat on a high rack attached to her owner's back. The homemade contraption that rested on his shoulders was decorated with well-chewed bird toys and hastily wiped droppings. Case shook the man's hand. Maria Sanchez, Alberto's mother, tearfully thanked him over and over for rescuing her, her son. They were also glad to see him. This is exactly what Case hated, a party in his honor for doing something that anyone would do. Saving a life was not a conscious act of bravery. It was just a reaction, undeserving of such hullabaloo. How would he endure this? That is when he saw Catarina de la Alvarado floating through the sea of faces with the grace of a ghost. She carried a cake. It had blue roses made of icing covering the top and circling the bottom. The single candle was a sparkler left over from some Cinco de Mayo past. Someone turned off the lights, and Catarina started singing Las Mañanitas, the traditional birthday song. The glow from flying bits of light framed a snapshot of her face that would remain in Case's mind for the rest of his life. Whenever he thought of her, she would be floating in a golden halo of ethereal sparks, just like this. Catarina placed the fiery cake in front of an older woman. The sparkler sputtered out, the lights flipped on again, and 18 people, plus the ones hanging out the back door into the yard, shouted, Abuelita, feliz cumpleaños! Speech! Speech! Case felt foolish. The party was not for him. <laughs> Small, lovely, and brown, Abuelita curtsied and held up her hand to sign up for subjects. <coughs> I declare we will eat the cake now, before dinner. Life is short and dessert must come first. <laughs>